section thirty six of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by etienne piver de senancour translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two seventh year letter fifty one paris september two seven a certain saint felice who was formerly a hermit at franchard in the forest of fontainebleau is said to lie buried in the vicinity of that monastery under what is known as the weeping rock a vast boulder of freestone with an approximate cubical dimension of an ordinary room in accordance with the variations of the seasons water flows out copiously or distils drop by drop from this boulder and falls upon a smooth concave stone hollowed by the imperceptible but incessant work of the element to which special qualities are ascribed administered for the space of nine days it proves a salve for the eyes of small children those who are suffering from an affection of these organs or may be troubled by them one of these days are consequently brought to this weeping rock and at the end of the novena many go away cured i can scarcely say why i am mentioning on this particular day a place which i have forgotten so long but i am in dejection and therefore right i contrive to dispense with you in my more cheerful moods but i have recourse to you in dark moments like this i know many people who would take such a confession amiss which is however their own concern for assuredly they will have small cause to complain of me as i am quite unlikely to have recourse to them in the midst of my dejection for the rest my window has been open all night and now it is morning tranquil mild and clouded i think after all that i can guess why i have remembered this memorial of a melancholic religion amidst the mist and the rumours of the forest the heart of man so active and yet so perishable finds a kind of perpetuity in that communication of popular feelings by which they are propagated increased and eternalized so to speak a boorish unkempt unintelligent hermit not impossibly a rogue and in any case useless to the world summons all generations to his tomb by assuming to devote himself to nothingness on this earth he becomes thereon the recipient of an immortal veneration he says in effect to men i renounce all that is claimed by your desires i am unworthy to be included among you and this abnegation uplifts him to the altar between the supreme power and all the aspirations of humanity he who achieves greatness is expected by the crowd either to take his departure amidst some great tumult or alternatively under some hypocritical subterfuge to proceed by the way of their immolation or their deception by insulting their misfortune or their credulity the man who destroys them is august he who brutalizes them is accounted venerable to me all this is indifferent i confess that i am strongly inclined to set the opinion of the sages before that of the people the possession of the esteem of my friends and the general goodwill i should account a necessity but a great reputation would be merely an amusement i might own to a little caprice in that direction but not assuredly to any passion what influence on the felicity of my days can possibly reside in a renown which is next to nothing while i live though it may be increased after my death it is the arrogance of the living which pronounces with so much respect the great names of the departed i fail to distinguish any very solid advantage in being subservient for a thousand years to the passions of divers parties and all the caprices of opinion it is enough for me if no true man can accuse my memory all else is vanity chance decides it but too often and still more frequently the means displease me i would be neither charles the twelfth nor pacom 
to seek after glory and to fail is the height of humiliation to deserve and to lose it is perhaps mournful to attain it is not the first end of man tell me whether the greatest names are those of just men when it is possible for us to perform good actions let us do so for their own sake and if we are cut off by our state of life from the opportunity of the greater achievements do not let us forego those small things which find no recompense in glory let us leave the incertitudes and rest satisfied with goodness in obscurity plenty of men who seek renown for its own sake will provide that mode of power which may be needed in great states for ourselves let us aim only at the conduct which should ensure glory and be indifferent to the fantasies of destiny which at times accord it to happiness refuse it at times to heroism and dispense it so rarely to purity of intention for some days past i have experienced a profound regret for simple things i grow weary already at paris not that it is absolutely distasteful but i could never be satisfied in places which i am merely passing through this is also the season which never fails to remind me of all the sweetness which might be met with in domestic life if two friends at the head of two small and united families possessed two neighbouring homes in the heart of the green country among woods not over far from a town yet sufficiently isolated from its influence the morning would be consecrated to serious pursuits and the evening to those trifles which are as interesting as important occupations when the latter are not too anxious i desire no longer a life of complete obscurity forgotten in the midst of the mountains things so simple have ceased to content me since that which is little is denied me i wish for that which is more the persistent reluctance of my destiny has increased my wants i sought that simplicity in which the heart of man reposes now i seek that only in which his mind can also play a part i would not merely enjoy peace but have the satisfaction of settling its terms where it reigns universally its acquisition would be too easy finding everything that is needful to the wants of the sage i should not have the wherewithal to fill the hours of a restless spirit hence i begin to scheme to set eyes on the future to think of a later age i might know even the passion for life i wonder whether you pay proper attention to those nothings which interweave and weld together all the members of a household and the friends connected therewith to those small details which cease to be small from the moment that we become attached to any of them are concerned about them and combine in the attempt to attain them during the first dry days after winter when the sun warms the grass and all are seated upon it or when the women-folk sing in some shadowy corner while the moon shines behind the oak trees are we not just as well off as if we were ranged in a circle labouring with insipid phrases or immured in a box at the opera where the breath of two thousand humanities more or less doubtful as regards their health or cleanliness brings you out in moist heat all over remember also those entertaining and recurring pursuits of a free life if amidst advancing age we seek them no longer we can at least enter into them we see how our wives cling to them how our children take their delight in them the violets found with such joy and sought with such interest the strawberries blackberries hazelnuts the harvest of wild pears the gathering of fallen chestnuts of fir apples for the autumn hearth pleasant customs of a more natural life felicity of simple men simplicity of favoured lands i see you all and you chill me you will say i expected a pastoral exclamation were it better to utter one on the quaverings of an opera singer you are wrong you are too reasonable what pleasure has it brought you nevertheless i fear that all too soon i may become equally reasonable he has come who he he deserves well to be unnamed some day i think that he may be one of us the shape of his head you laugh perhaps also at that and yet the profile of his nose forms with the frontal line an angle so barely traceable as you will let us leave all that but if i grant you that lavater is an enthusiast you must admit in return that he is not at least a dotard i submit that to discover the character and the gifts above all of men in their lineaments is a concept of genius and not a mere mockery of imagination 
examine the heads of one of the most exceptional men of modern times you know whom i mean when i saw his bust i guessed immediately that it was he though i had no other guide than the likeness between what he had done and what i was looking at fortunately i was not alone and this fact counts in my favour for the rest no researchers are perhaps less susceptible of the certitude of the exact sciences centuries hence the character the tendencies the natural gifts may be known with some accuracy yet there will be always a liability to error as regards that part of the character which is modified by accidental circumstances without having the time or the power to alter the features sensibly of the works on this difficult subject the fragments of lavater form i think the most curious i will bring them with me we ran over them too superficial at metaville and must read them afresh i have no wish to add anything further till then but i foresee that we shall have the pleasure of discussing the subject at some length End of section 36section thirty seven of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by etienne piver de senancourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two seventh year letter fifty two paris october nine seven i am exceedingly pleased with your young friend while i think that he will become an amiable man i also feel sure that he will be anything but merely amiable he is starting to-morrow for lyons you will remind him that he leaves two persons behind him by whom he will not be forgotten there is no need for speculation as to the second she is worthy to feel a mother's love for him but is too amiable not to be herself loved after another manner while he is too young to foresee and avoid that fascination which would win entrance under the guise of an attachment that in itself is so legitimate i am not sorry that he is going you are warned and will talk to him prudently he justifies as it seems to me all the interest that you take in him and if he were your son i should congratulate you your own would be his age exactly and he has no father spared to him your son and his mother died before their time i do not scruple to refer to these things for old sorrows may sadden but do not torture us such bitterness deep but still assuaged and rendered bearable by time becomes to us as if necessary it makes us revert to our ways of old it is pleasing to our hearts which are so hungry for emotions and seek even amidst their regrets for the infinite your daughter remains to you and she so good so sweet so interesting even as those who are no more can fill their place for you however great may be your losses your misfortune is not that of the unfortunate but solely of mankind if those whom you have lost had been left you your felicity would have exceeded the measure which is accorded to the happy yield therefore to their memory those recollections which they deserve so well without dwelling too much on the sentiment of irremediable loss cherish peace cherish the moderation of which nothing should wholly deprive a man and sympathize with me who am so divided from you in this respect reverting to him whom you have designated as my protege i might say that he is rather your own but in truth you are more than his protector nor do i see that his father could have done better for him this i think he realizes and what is more with no affectation in the feeling although in our country sojourn we talked about you in every woodland corner and at every meadow end he scarcely said anything of his obligations towards you to me he had no need to speak of them for i knew you too well to me it would have been wrong to speak of them i am not one of your friends at the same time i know what he said to madame 
t with whom i repeat that he was delighted and to you she is herself most attached i had already advised you that we should make continual excursions in the environs of paris i must give you an account of these visits so that you may receive a lengthy letter before my departure for lyons and may no longer be able to say that i have sent you only three lines in the course of the present year as if i were a busy man of the world he grew weary of paris very soon though his is the age for curiosity it is scarcely of that kind which can be nourished for an indefinite time by a large city he takes less interest in a medallion than in a ruined chateau in the forest though his manners are agreeable he will leave the choicest gathering for covert where there is plenty of game and his dawning taste for art notwithstanding he will forsake a sunrise by vernay very willingly for a fine morning and the most realistic landscape of hue for the vales of bievre or montmorency you are eager to know what has happened to us and to hear where we have been in the first place nothing has happened for the rest you shall learn but as yet no i have a fancy for the devious do you know that it is quite within possibility that some day he will love paris though it does not attract him now it may be possible you reply a little coldly and would turn to another subject but i interrupt you for i would have you convinced on the point it is not natural for a young man of sensibility to care much for a capital seeing that a capital is not wholly natural to man he requires a pure air a bright sky a boundless prospect for wandering adventuring hunting in a word for liberty he is more attracted by the laborious tranquillity of farms and forests than by the turbulent luxury of these our prisons hunting tribes cannot understand how a free man can bring himself to the tillage of the earth and for our friend he is unable to conceive how any one can immure himself in a town and still less how he himself may one day love what now he finds so irksome the time will come all the same when the most lovely country scene though it will always be lovely in his eyes will be to him as something that is alien his attention will be engrossed by a new order of ideas other sensations will take naturally the place of those which now alone seem natural when the sentiment of things factitious will be as familiar to him as that of simple things the latter will become insensibly effaced from his heart not that the former will have become more attractive but because they will move him more the relations of man with man stimulate all our passions they are accompanied by so much of trouble they maintain us in such a continuous agitation that repose after these overwhelms us like the stillness of those naked deserts where there is neither variety nor motion nothing to seek and nothing to hope the occupations and the sense of rustic life animate without distressing the soul and amidst these it is happy the solicitudes of social life disturb attract exalt and urge it on every side in a word they enslave it thus the great game hinders and fatigues humanity his fatal inclination renders indispensable these alternatives of hope and fear which engross and consume him i must try and get back to my subject but i warn you that i shall again break away without fail i feel very well disposed for unseasonable argument we determined to travel on foot a proceeding which was much to his taste but fortunately it was not at all the inclination of his servant and therefore to avoid a discontented attendant who would have followed our very simple arrangements with exceeding bad grace i found some commissions for him at paris where we left him to his no greater satisfaction i am happy here to be able to break off and inform you that valets have a love of extravagance 
they share all the resources and advantages of their masters with none of their anxieties but they do not share them so directly as to be satiated and thus cease to value them how therefore could they do otherwise than like them they have the secret of making them minister to their vanity when the master's carriage is the smartest in the town it is clear that the lackey is a person of some importance and assuming him to be modestly disposed he can scarcely forego the pleasure of being the chief lackey in the district i know of one who was overheard remarking that a domestic may find food for vanity in the service of a wealthy master just as a noble is honoured in serving a great king and speaks with pride of the king my master this man must have taken lessons in the antechamber and is lost i simply selected from the commissionaires a man whom they could answer for he carried our small supply of linen and other necessary effects was a convenience in many respects and a hindrance in none he seemed perfectly contented to walk without tiring himself in the rear of those who fed him well and treated him still better while we on our part were not sorry in an expedition of this kind to have a man at our disposal with whom it was possible to drop the tone of the master without being compromised he proved very useful and very discreet as a travelling companion but one who did not lack courage occasionally to walk abreast with us and even impart his observations and his curiosity without our feeling bound to silence him and send him behind us with a certain half-glance of dignity we set out on september fourteen it was pleasant autumn weather and so continued with little interruption throughout all our wandering the sky calm the sun weak and often clouded the mornings misty the evenings fine the earth moist but the roads clean in a word the most favourable of seasons and plenty of fruit everywhere we were in the best of health and of spirits he eager to see and ready to admire everything i well content to get exercise and above all to travel haphazard as for money many personages in the romances never appear to need it they carry a retinue they prosecute their enterprises they live everywhere no one exactly knowing how they obtain the means of doing so and often when it is quite clear that they cannot have such means the privilege is undoubtedly high but there are innkeepers who might be disposed to ignore it and so we thought it best to carry some funds about with us thus nothing was wanting to the one for his adequate amusement to the other for an agreeable circuit in the company of the one while many poor creatures were justly surprised to find that people who were expending a little gold on their own pleasure reserved a few sous for the needs of the unfortunate follow us on a map of the environs of paris imagine a circle having for its centre the fine bridge of neuilly near and lying due west this circle is twice bisected by the seine and once by the marne set aside the portion comprised between the marne and the little river of bievre take only the large circuit which begins at the marne crosses the seine below paris and ends at antony on the bievre you will then have approximately the track which we followed in our visit to the most thickly wooded prettiest or most passable scenes of a district which without being in any sense beautiful is reasonably attractive and diversified in this manner twenty days were expended at a cost of some eleven louis had we made this excursion in what might have appeared some more convenient manner we should have been tied and frequently thwarted we should have spent more and it would certainly have been less productive of amusement and good humour to bring too rigid an economy to bear on things of this kind is even a greater inconvenience it is better far to stay at home than to dread at each hostelry the appearance of the bill of fare and in ordering dinner to contrive in such a way as to order the least that is possible there is an end to all pleasure unless a certain ease and freedom are brought thereto it becomes not merely indifferent but disagreeable it raises hopes which cannot be fulfilled never turns out as it should and however little it has involved in care or money is at best a sacrifice for nothing in my small acquaintance with france chessel and fontainebleau are the only places where i should consent of my free will to settle down 
and of these two chessel is the only one in which i could wish to live you will hear of me there before long i have already told you that the aspens and birches of chessel are not like other aspens and other birches the chestnuts the ponds and the punt differ also from the rest of their species there the autumn sky is like the sky of the fatherland that muscat grape those pallid asters which are now loved by both of us though once you did not care for them and the fragrance of the hay of chessel in that splendid barn wherein we leaped in childhood what hay what cream cheeses and then those magnificent heifers how pleasantly the chestnuts poured from the sack roll upon the floor above my study it seems like a sound of our youth but pause my friend happiness is over you have your business you have a state of life your reason ripens your heart it is true does not change but i feel my own contracting you have no time any longer for setting chestnuts in the ashes they must be prepared for you what have you done with our pleasures six days hence in any case i shall be with you at chessel so much is decided End of section thirty seven Section thirty eight of Obermann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Obermann by Etienne Pierre Senancour. Translated by Arthur Edward Waite. Letter fifty three. Freiburg, March eleventh, eighth year what would have befallen me in the absence of this inheritance i can barely speculate assuredly i had no such expectations and yet i was more weary of the present than concerned for the future amidst the tedium of isolation i had at least the privilege of security the fear that i might want for necessities was scarcely present to my mind and now that no excuse for such fear can in any sense be said to remain, I experience how void it is for a heart without passions to have nothing pleasant to perform, and to be fated still to abide among strangers, though possessing the competence required for an easy life. It was time that I took my departure, for I was at once both well and very ill, I was in the enjoyment of those advantages which so many people seek without knowing them, which others condemn out of envy, which it would be distressing to be deprived of in society, though few pleasures are imparted by their possession. I am by no means one of those who regard wealth as despicable. Without home, with nothing to call for my management, free equally from dependence and embarrassment, I had what suited me well enough in such a town as Lyons, a tolerable lodging, horses, and a table at which I could entertain, shall I say, my friends. In a large town, any different way of life would have been more wearisome, yet that one did not content me. It might have offered some speciousness, had there been anyone to share it with me, who found pleasure therein. But I am of those who are destined to be ever as if they were not. We used often to say, that a reasonable man is not commonly unfortunate, supposing that he is free and has a modicum of that power which is imparted by money. I am here, notwithstanding, in Switzerland, without pleasure, a prey to weariness, and knowing not what resolution to take. I have no family. There is nothing to bind me to the place. You will not come, and I am utterly solitary. I am not without a certain confused hope that this state of things will end. Since it is possible for me eventually to settle down, I must think about doing so, and perhaps the rest will follow. Snow is still falling. I shall remain at Freiburg till the season is more advanced. You are aware that the servant who accompanies me hails from here. His mother, who lives at Freiburg, is very ill. She will have the consolation of his presence. Independently of this, for the next month or thereabouts, I am as well off here as elsewhere. Letter 54. Freiburg, March 25th. Eighth year. It was scarcely worth while, you tell me, to forsake lions so soon, 
and to take refuge in a country town. For my answer I send you a view of Freiburg, though it is not altogether accurate, and the artist has preferred to compose his scene rather than copy it faithfully. You will see, at least, that I am in the midst of the rocks. To be at Freiburg is to be also in the country. The town is environed by rocks and is built, in fact, upon them. Almost every street has a steep incline, but despite its inconvenient situation, it is better planned than most of the small towns in France. In the vicinity, and even outside the gates, there are many picturesque and a few somewhat wild scenes. The hermitage, termed the Madeleine, does not, however, deserve its notoriety. It is occupied by a species of fool who has turned a half-saint, finding no other folly for a refuge. This man has never had the spirit of his condition. In the executive he was not a magistrate, and in the hermitage he is not a hermit. He wore the hair shirt under his officer's uniform, and he wears the hussar's trousers under the anchorite's garb. The rock was well selected by the first founders. It is dry and in a good situation. The persistency of the two men who excavated it unaided is assuredly not a little remarkable. Yet this hermitage, which is visited by all the curious, is among those things which it serves no purpose to see, and of which an adequate conception can be formed by a knowledge of its dimensions. I have nothing to tell you of the townsfolk, for I am not one of those who become gifted with the knowledge of a people after a few minutes' talk to one or two of them. I am not a traveller by nature. I notice merely a touch of the old times in their manners. The antique characteristics are effaced slowly among them. Men and places still wear the Helvetic physiognomy. Tourists seldom come here, for there are no glaciers or lakes of importance, and no monuments. Those notwithstanding, who are visiting only the western parts of Switzerland, should at least cross the canton of Freiburg at the base of its mountains. The low grounds of Geneva, Morg, Everton, Nadau, and Annette are not Swiss at all. They are like the low-lying lands of other countries. Letter 55. Freiburg, March 30th, 8th year. I perceive, as of old, the charm of a beautiful scene, but I feel it less, or the way in which I feel it is no longer sufficient for me. I could rather say, I remember that this is beautiful. In the past, also, I turned away from places that were lovely, but then it was through impetuosity of longing, the disquietude begotten of that which is enjoyed alone, and that it was possible to possess more completely. Today again I leave them, but it is because of the weariness of their silence. They do not speak loud enough for me. That which I would see and hear is not to be seen or heard, and I am conscious that having failed so utterly to find myself in outward things, I am coming to such a pass that I cease to find myself in myself. I am beginning to look upon the physically beautiful as upon moral illusions. All grows pallid imperceptibly, as grow it must. The consciousness of what is visibly agreeable is only the indirect perception of an intellectual harmony. How shall I find in outward things those emotions which are no longer in my heart, that eloquence of the passions which I possess not, those still sounds, those transports of hope, those accents of the being who enjoys the allurement of a world henceforth renounced? Letter 56 Thun, May 2nd, 8th year All must end, inevitably, Slowly and by gradations, only does man increase his being, and after the same manner he must lose it. I respond no longer to anything except that which is extraordinary. I need romantic sounds before I begin to hear, and novel sights if I am to remember that which I loved in an earlier age. End of section 38
section thirty nine of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m Piver de senancour translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two eighth year letters fifty seven fifty eight and fifty nine letter fifty seven the baths of schwarzsee morning of may sixth year eighth the snow has melted early from the roots of the mountains i am going to and fro in search of a dwelling and reckon to tarry here some two days the valley is smooth and the mountains are steep from the very base encompassed by pastures pines and waters it is one of those solitudes which i love and it is a fair season yet the hours are long we have spent some pleasant ones by your pool of chessel you found it too small but here where the lake is well enclosed and its expanse considerable you would lose patience with the keeper of the baths he takes in a number of invalids during the summer for whom exercise and something to while away the time must be both necessary and yet he has no boat though the lake is full of fish letter fifty eight may sixth evening here as elsewhere and perhaps rather more than elsewhere there are fathers of families who continue firmly persuaded that a well-conducted woman should barely know how to read since those who believe that they can write forthwith indite letters to lovers while on the other hand bad writers do not have lovers at all furthermore to ensure their daughters turning out good housewives knowledge should be confined preferably to the making of good soup and keeping stock of the kitchen linen notwithstanding a husband whose wife has no other gift than the preparation of fresh and salt broth is apt to grow bored to feel weary of home life and to contract the habit of absenting himself he is alienated the more quickly when his wife thus forsaken and thus engrossed by household cares herself becomes soured in disposition he ends by being always away when she has passed thirty years of age and amidst so many opportunities of expenditure by dissipating elsewhere the money which is essential for his immunity from weariness but which also would have made things easy at home distress enters ill temper increases and the children left invariably with their discontented mother wait only for the age of escape like their father from the wretchedness of that domestic life to which parents and children might have been attached equally had a sweeter disposition in the woman established from her youth upwards a more cheerful spirit therein such little drawbacks are acknowledged by family men of this kind but where is it otherwise they would argue besides we must also be just and confess that there is some compensation for the saucepans are always bright these excellent housewives know precisely the number of stitches which their daughters should knit in an hour and how many candles should be burnt after supper in any well-regulated domicile they correspond well enough to the requirements of certain men who pass two-thirds of their days in drinking and smoking the chief consideration for these is that they should not be compelled to devote more batson to their house and their children than they spend crowns in the alehouse and for the rest they have married to secure a first-class servant in homes where these principles obtain few marriages are dissolved because nobody willingly repudiates a drudge who looks well after him receives no wages and has brought him a dowry but seldom also do we find the sort of union which confers happiness on life is adequate to the needs of a man and dispenses him from seeking elsewhere for enjoyments that are less real and to which undeniable disadvantages attach the defenders of these principles are capable of citing the slender intimacy which characterizes marriages in paris 
and other marriages in places which are like paris as if the reasons which make such intimacy out of the question in capitals where conjugal union is not thought of could obtain in an altogether different walk of life and in places where such intimacy would spell felicity there it is pitiable to remark the isolation of the two sexes nothing is so sad above all for women who have so little in the way of compensation for whom there are no pleasurable hours and no places of relaxation rebuffed soured and reduced either to a rigid economy or to a life of muddle they set themselves to follow the routine with moroseness and even through spite they meet among themselves but seldom and become devotees because they know no place of refuge but the church letter fifty nine from the chateau de chupon may twenty two by two o'clock behold us already in the woods in quest of strawberries they covered the southern slopes and though many were barely formed there were yet a goodly number which had already the bloom and fragrance of maturity the strawberry is one of the sweetest of natural products it is plentiful and wholesome so far even as the borders of the polar zones i regard it as among fruits what the violet is among flowers delightful beautiful and simple its odour is diffused by the light breath of the zephyrs as that breath fitfully penetrates the leafy arches of the woodland stirs gently among thorny thickets or lifts and trains the bindweeds clinging to the high trunks it is borne abroad into the densest umbrage by the warm air of the more open ground where the strawberry also ripens it blends with the moist freshness and seems to exhale from moss and bramble sylvan harmonies ye are made up of such contrasts while the stir of the breeze was almost imperceptible in the fresh and shady solitudes a rough wind was blowing freely over the summits of the fir-trees their branches shivered clashed and interlaced with a romantic sound and the topmost twigs separating ever and again in their swaying revealed to us their pyramidal crowns made splendid by the radiance of day and glowing with all its fires above the shadows of that silent soil from which their roots drew nourishment when our baskets were filled we bade good-bye to the woods some all gaiety and the rest contented we proceeded by narrow paths over meadows enclosed by hedges planted through all their length with well-grown wild cherries and tall wild pears land which is still patriarchal when man has ceased to be so without precisely experiencing pleasure i was still at my ease i said to myself that pure delights are in a sense merely tasted that economy in enjoyments is so to speak the industry of happiness that it is insufficient for a pleasure to be merely free from remorse or simply without alloy in order to be truly pure that it is requisite further that only enough of it should be accepted to perceive its flavour to nourish the hope concerning it and that one must know how to reserve for other days its most alluring promises to prolong enjoyments by eluding desire to refrain in any way from precipitating a joy to forbear from exhausting life in all this there is a very refined rapture we do not properly enjoy the present unless we look forward to a future which will at least be its equal and we lose all happiness if we seek to be absolutely happy this law of nature constitutes the inexpressible charms of a first love a certain tardiness is essential to our enjoyments a continuity in their development and a certain vagueness about their limit we need constant pleasure rather than acute and transient emotions the tranquil possession which is self-sufficient in its domestic peace and not that fever of delight which with a consuming intoxication destroys by the repletion of our hearts outwearied by its repetitions its loathings the emptiness of all its hopes and the exhaustion of its innumerable regrets 
but ought even our reason to dream in the midst of a restless society of that felicity independent of pleasures of that repose so ill understood of that constant and simple well-being wherein enjoyment ceases to be thought of where there is no longer any need of desire such should be the heart of man but man has transformed his life he has denaturalized his heart and colossal shadows have intervened to weary his desires because the natural proportions of true beings have seemed too precise for his foolish grandeur social varieties frequently remind me of the overweening puerility of a prince who thought it a great achievement to order the symbol of autocracy to be emblazoned with lamps on the vast slope of a mountain we have also emblazoned the mountains but our labours have been on a lesser scale the performance of our own hands and not the work of slaves we have not had masters to receive but friends to place a deep ravine borders the castle woods and is hollowed among precipitous and savage rocks at the top of these rocks and in the heart of the forest there would appear to have been quarries in the past the sharp angles which the excavations originally left have been rounded by time but a kind of enclosure remains forming nearly the half of a hexagon and large enough to hold some six or eight persons with ease after slightly levelling the stones which form the floor and improvising the bench designed to serve as the buffet we contrived a circular seat of large branches covered with leaves the table was a plank mounted on logs left thereabouts by the beech cutters all this had been prepared in the morning but the secret was well kept and laden with strawberries we conducted our hosts into this wild and unfamiliar retreat the women seemed overjoyed at discovering the conveniences of an elegant simplicity encompassed by a scene of terror branches of pine were lighted in an angle of the rock overhanging the precipice which was rendered less affrighting by the foremost branches of the beech trees spoons of boxwood fashioned after the manner of kukisberg glasses of fine porcelain baskets of wild cherries were ranged informally on the stone buffet reinforced by platefuls of clotted mountain cream and bowls of that second cream which serves for coffee and with its slight flavour and perfume of almonds is said to be only known in the alps decanters filled with sweetened water stood ready for the strawberries the coffee was not ground or even roasted such cares are fitly relinquished to the women who as a rule prefer to have charge of them because they realize keenly that we must prepare our own enjoyments and must owe partially at least to ourselves that which we desire to possess a pleasure which offers of itself without being to some extent sought out by desire not infrequently loses its grace as a good thing too long awaited misses also frequently the right moment on which its merit depends all was prepared all seemed to have been foreseen and the coffee was on the point of being made when the simplest of all the requisites proved to be wanting there was in fact no water we set about joining some cords which till then had been designed only for binding the branches for our seats or securing those which shaded us and at the sacrifice of some of the flagons we succeeded in drawing some ice-cold water from the torrent three hundred feet below us we made a familiar party and our laughter had the ring of sincerity the weather was beautiful the wind raged through the long ravine where in the darksome depth the torrent all white with foam surged between the pointed rocks the kahoo sang in the woods about us and woods higher up multiplied all these austere sounds the great bells of the cows going up to kusenberg could be heard at a long distance the wild odour of the burning pine wood blended with the mountain sounds and in the midst of simple fruits in a desert asylum the coffee smoked on the social board those notwithstanding among us who alone enjoyed these moments were those who were unconscious of the moral harmony 
ah sad faculty of dwelling on that which is absent but no two hearts were alike among us not in every man has unsearchable nature placed the end of his life the void and the overwhelming truth are in the heart which pries into itself the transporting illusion can come only from one who is loved we do not experience the vanity of the good things possessed by another and thus by its own self-deception every affectionate heart may become truly happy amidst the nothingness of all direct advantages for myself i fell to dreaming instead of experiencing pleasure there is very little that i really require but i want this little to be in harmony the most alluring pleasures would not attract me if discord were found therein and the feeblest of unblemished enjoyments is sufficient for all my desires simplicity is hence my necessity this alone is harmonic to-day the scenery was too beautiful our picturesque dining-hall our rustic hearth a snack of fruit and cream our transient familiarity the song of a few birds and the wind continually flinging fir leaves into our cups these were enough but the torrent in the darkness the far-away rumours of the mountains these were too much yet it was i only who heard End of section thirty nine section forty of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m pivert de senancourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two eighth year letters sixty and sixty one letter sixty villeneuve june sixteen eight i have just returned from a pilgrimage through most of the habitable valleys between charmey tun sion st maurice and vevey hope did not prompt me to take it nor did i do so to admire or to enjoy once again i have seen those mountains which i had beheld nearly seven years ago i did not take back to them that impulse of an age which sought so eagerly their wild beauties the old names distinguished them and i bear also the same i threw myself on the strand near chillon i listened to the waves and yet again i sought to interpret their voices there in that same spot where i had tarried of old that strand so beautiful in my memory those waves which france does not know and the high mountain summits and chillon le mans have failed to impress or to satisfy me i was there as i have been elsewhere i may revisit places i cannot restore times what manner of man am i now were it not for the consciousness of an order for the desire to be still of some good i should conclude that the consciousness of external things is already extinct and that all which within me connects with ordered nature has ceased to be you will not expect from me a historical statement or the descriptions of an observing traveller designed for the instruction of himself and the general improvement of geographical knowledge a recluse will scarcely discourse to you of human society which you frequent more than himself he will not have adventures to recount or the romance of his life to unfold but that which i experience i continue to impart as agreed because it is with me that you are familiar and not with that which environs me when we converse with one another it is about ourselves only for there is nothing more near to us it occurs to me sometimes with surprise that we did not live together there is a certain contradiction and something of impossibility about it an occult destiny must have drawn me to seek far from you for i know not what when it was open to me to remain where you were but forbidden to take you away with me i can scarcely say what necessity has recalled me into a region 
in which although set apart from the common i find beauty no longer nor yet can find myself was not our tendency to think and to feel in common actually my foremost requirement was it not indispensable that we should dream apart from all on that great agitation which hollows in the perishable heart an abyss of longing incapable of being filled as it would seem otherwise than by imperishable things we taught ourselves to smile at that impulse ever ardent and ever deceived we applauded that skill which has made capital out of it to prove us immortal we sought zealously for examples of the grossest and most powerful illusions so that we also might be persuaded that death itself and all visible things were but phantoms and that intelligence would be prolonged through some divine dream we abandon ourselves with a species of indifference and impassibility to forgetfulness of the things of earth and in the unison of our two souls we pictured the harmony of a divine world concealed under the vesture of the visible but now i am alone with nothing to sustain me longer four days since i roused up a man who was perishing in the snow upon sanets his wife his two children all dependent on him and of whom he appears to be truly the husband and father as were the patriarchs of old and as one is still in the mountains and the deserts all three exhausted and half dead with fear and cold were calling to him among the rocks and over the edge of the glacier at length we came to them imagine a wife and two children happy and all the rest of the day i breathed as a free man and there was an unwanted elasticity in my step but since then the same silence has environed me nothing transpires to render me sensible of my existence hence i have been seeking through all the valleys to acquire some isolated pasturage which will yet be easily accessible moderately clement in temperature pleasantly situated watered by a stream and within sound of a torrent or the waves of a lake i have no wish for a pretentious domain but something good-sized and of the kind which is not met with in the rhone valley i want also to build a timber house which will be easier here than in the bas valley when i have settled i shall go to st maurice and charrière i am not anxious to do so at present in case my natural indolence and the attachment to places which i form so easily if i have any attraction towards them should tempt me to remain at charrière i prefer to select a convenient site and then build after my own fashion with the view of locating myself for a time or perhaps for always hans who speaks the patois and knows also a little german of the oberland explored the valleys and highways collecting information in the villages for myself i proceeded from chalet to chalet across the mountains and through places which he would not have dared to pass though he is more robust than i am and more at home in the alps places let me add which i should not have attempted myself if i had not been alone i have found an estate which would suit me to admiration but i am not sure that i can acquire it there are three owners two at la guerriere and the third at vevey and this last they say has no intention of selling but i require the whole notwithstanding if you know of any new map of switzerland or of a topographical chart of some of its divisions pray send it on to me anything obtainable here is exceedingly faulty though i know that recent maps are often very carefully executed marking the position of many places with considerable exactitude it must be confessed that very few countries are so difficult to survey i have thought of attempting myself a survey of the small area comprised between vevey saint gangouf aigle sepe etivaz mont Beauvain, and some salve always supposing that i secure the estate i mentioned near the don de germain which would be the apex of my principal triangles 
i have promised myself to while away in this labour the restless season of heat and fine weather i should have undertaken it next year but this i have now renounced when all the gorges all the further sides and all points of view are familiar to me in all their details nothing will be left for me to find it is far better to reserve the sole means of escape from periods of intolerable weariness by losing myself in new places seeking eagerly for things which do not interest me in any sense clamouring the most difficult peaks with zeal for the verification of an angle to make sure of a line which i shall forget afterwards that i may return and observe it as if i had really some purpose in view letter sixty one saint saffarin june twenty six eight i do not regret having brought hans with me tell madame t that i send my thanks for her gift he seems to me frank and susceptible of attachment he is intelligent also and plays on the horn with more skill than i should have expected in the evening when the moon has risen i charter two boats in my own i take one oarsman only and when we have got well out upon the lake there is a bottle of wine provided for him on condition that he sits still and says nothing hans occupies the second boat and the rowers therein gently dip their oars in the water as they pass to and fro at a little distance in front of my own which rests without motion or is swayed softly by the light swell of the waves his horn accompanies him and two german women sing in concert he is an excellent man and one whom i must bind to my interests as he has already discovered that his situation is tolerably advantageous he assures me that he has no further anxiety and that he hopes i shall keep him always i think that hope is well founded why should i forego this my sole advantage the service of a contented man for certain intimate acquaintances i once renounced the only resources which i possessed to relinquish to one another those who seemed to find some felicity together i gave up my only hope these and yet other sacrifices have produced no good result but here is a valet who is happy and yet i have done nothing for him beyond treating him as a man i esteem him because such treatment has not caused him surprise and he regards it so simply that he is unlikely to abuse it besides it is not true that kindness ordinarily produces insolence it is weakness which does so hans is fully aware that i talk to him somewhat confidentially but he realizes quite as fully that i know how to speak as a master you would not suspect him of reading the julia of rousseau but as we rode yesterday over to the savoy side he exclaimed this then is Melurie the incident need not disturb you remember that he is devoid of pretensions he would not be with me if he had the spirit of the ante-room the harmony of sounds above all by uniting an undefined extension to a sensible yet vague motion imparts to the soul that perception of the infinite which it believes itself to possess in time and space i confess that it is natural for man to regard himself as less bounded and finite as something greater than his present life when some sudden perception unveils the contrasts and equilibrium the interchainment and organization of the universe this perception manifests like the discovery of a world which he has yet to explore like the initial glimpse of that which may be one day fully disclosed to him i have a preference for songs that are in a language which is unknown to me words otherwise mar in my estimation the beauty of the air or at least detract from its effect it is scarcely possible that the ideas which they express should accord completely with those which the sounds impart to me moreover the german accent has something peculiarly romantic slurred and indeterminate syllables do not please me in music our mute e is disagreeable when the song forces it to obtrude 
and the useless syllable of feminine rhymes is rendered almost always in a false and grating manner because in fact it is almost impossible to produce it otherwise i am very fond of the blending of two or more voices it leaves all its power and all its simplicity to the melody as for scientific harmony those beauties are unknown to me not being schooled in music i do not enjoy what depends only on art or on difficulties the lake is exceedingly lovely when the moon whitens our two sails when the echoes of chillon repeat the notes of the horn and the vast wall of mylory contrasts its darkness with the soft luminosity of the sky with the glancing lights of the waters when the waves break against our drifting boats when their far-away roll is audible on the countless pebbles brought down by the vevays from the mountains you who have the gift of enjoyment why are you not here to listen to these two women's voices sounding in the night over the waters for myself i must leave all i like notwithstanding to be warned of my losses when the austere beauty of scenery prompts me to forget how vain is all in man even to his regrets pool of chessel our wanderings there were less beautiful but they were more happy nature overwhelms the heart of man but friendship satisfies it we lean mutually on each other we converse and all is forgotten i shall secure the place in question but must wait a few days before i can obtain the evidences required for completion i shall then put the work in hand forthwith for the season is advancing end of section forty section forty one of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by etienne piver de senancourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two eighth year letters sixty two and sixty three letter sixty two july eighth year i have been all along meaning to ask you for a copy of the manual of Susufani. i have lost my own how i do not quite know there is nothing in it about which i really need to be admonished but reading it morning by morning i shall be reminded more vividly how much i ought to be ashamed of my weakness i am thinking of appending a note on certain hygienic matters on those things of individual and so to speak local habit to which in my opinion sufficient importance is not attached aristippus could scarcely enjoin them or his imaginary disciple or on his real followers but this note would be of more practical utility than general considerations for maintaining in my case that well-being and physical efficiency which combine to support the soul itself so physical i labour under two great disabilities one alone would possibly prove my destruction but between the two i contrive to go on living because of the opposition between them were it not for my constitutional melancholy my dejection my abdication were it not for my quiet animosity against all that is held desirable the activity which constrains and convulses me would consume me sooner and not less vainly my disillusion serves at least to reduce it reason should moderate it but between two such gigantic forces my reason is weak indeed all that it can do is to invoke the one to its assistance when the other strives to predominate thus it is possible to vegetate sometimes even to sleep letter sixty three july eighth year it was midnight the moon had set the lake was restless the sky clear the night deep and lovely amidst the vagueness brooding over the earth might be heard the shivering of birches and the fall of poplar leaves 
the pines gave forth wild murmurs romantic sounds fell from the mountains vast billows broke upon the strand presently the osprey began to cry among the cavernous rocks as she finished the waves subsided and there was an austere silence yet amidst the restless quietude at long intervals the nightingale uttered her lonely single reiterated note song of ecstatic nights sublime rendering of a primeval melody unspeakable outburst of love and sorrow voluptuous as the want which consumes me simple mysterious immense as the heart which loves abandoned in a kind of funereal repose to the measured motion of those pale mute unceasing waves i became permeated with that movement so slow and unvaried with that enduring peace those sounds isolated in the long silence too beautiful seemed nature too soft too sweet those waters the earth and the night the tranquil harmony of all things was too much for my perturbed heart i dreamed of the springtide of the perishable world and the springtide of my life i beheld the years as they passed sad and sterile from the eternity of the future into the eternity of the lost i beheld the present always vain and never possessed unlinking its indefinite chain from the vague future bringing my death nearer till it became visible marshalling through the night the phantoms of my days decreasing dissolving them overtaking the last shadow devouring as indifferently that day which will have none to succeed it and closing the mute abyss as if all men had not passed away and all had not passed in vain as if life were real and essentially existing as if the perception of the universe were the consciousness of a positive being and the human ego more than the fortuitous expression of a transient combination what would i what am i what do i ask of nature is it a universal system conformities rights in correspondence with our needs does intelligence bring about those results for which my intelligence is looking every cause is hidden each end deceptive every form changes all duration slips away and the agony of the insatiable heart is but the blind course of a meteor wandering in the void where it must be lost nothing is possessed as we anticipate nothing known as it is we perceive relations only not essences we do not make use of things but of their images sought without us and impenetrable within us nature is dark everywhere i feel is the sole affirmation for him who would have truth only and that which constitutes the certitude of my existence is also its torture i do feel i do exist but it is to be consumed by unconquerable desires to be plunged in the sorcery of a fantastic world to be overwhelmed by its voluptuous deception what is happiness not the first law of human nature pleasure not the first motive spring of the sensible world if we do not seek pleasure what end do we propose ourselves if to live be merely to exist what need have we to live we can discover neither the first cause nor the true motive of any being the wherefore of the universe remains inaccessible to individual intelligence the end of our existence is unknown to us every act of life is void of object our desires our cares our affections are ridiculous if these acts do not tend to pleasure if these affections do not propose it to themselves man loves himself he loves man he loves all animate things such love would seem essential to the organized being it is the motive power of the forces which preserve him man loves himself without this active principle how could he act how subsist man loves men because he feels as they feel because he is close to them in the order of the world 
what for him would be life in the absence of this relationship man loves all animate things if he ceased to suffer at the sight of suffering if he ceased to feel with those whose sensations are analogous to his own he would cease to be interested in anything outside himself and might cease to love even himself there is assuredly no affection wholly limited to the individual since there is no being who is completely isolated if man feels in all things animate the blessings and the evils which encompass him are as real for him as his personal affections the happiness of all that he knows is requisite to his own happiness he is bound up with all that feels his life is in the organized world the chain of correspondences which have him for their centre which cannot end entirely save at the limits of the world constitutes him a part of the universe a numerical unity in the number of nature the bond formed by these personal bonds is the order of the world and the force which perpetuates its harmony is natural law the necessary instinct which impels the animate being passive when he permits it and active when he wills it to be so is a subjection to general laws obedience to the spirit of these laws would be the science of any being who exercised will freely the freedom of man in deliberation would be the science of human life that which he wills in subjection shows forth to him how he should will when he is independent there is no perfection for an isolated being his existence is incomplete he is neither truly happy nor truly good the complement of everything is outside itself but that complement is reciprocal there is a certain species of end for natural beings and it is in that which causes productiveness when two bodies are brought together which increases enjoyment when two sensations are shared mutually everything that exists is completed all that is animated finds repose and satisfaction in this harmony this complement of the individual is chiefly in the species and for man it has two modes at once dissimilar and analogous such is his heritage he is conscious of his life after two manners the rest is either suffering or nothingness every unshared possession irritates our desires without filling our hearts in place of nourishing it voids and exhausts them to ensure harmony and union the being who participates in our enjoyment must be like us and yet different such conformity in the same species is found either in the difference between individuals or in the opposition of the sexes the first accord produces the harmony which results from two being similar and diverse with the smallest degree of opposition and the greatest degree of similitude the second gives a harmonic result produced by the greatest possible difference between those who are alike all choice all affection all union all happiness consist in these two modes whatsoever removes us from these may attract but it deceives and exhausts us what is contrary to them misleads us making us either vicious or miserable we have no legislators nowadays some among the ancients attempted to lead man by his heart and being incapable of imitating we blame their course institutions are forgotten in the concern for civil and penal laws no genius has yet discovered all laws of society all duties of life in the necessity which unites men in that which joins the sexes there is division amidst the unity of the species kindred beings differ however in such a way that their very contrasts incline them to love one another separated by their tastes yet necessary each to each they are divided by their habits and conjoined by a mutual necessity those who spring from their union formed equally of both will not withstanding perpetuate these differences this essential effect of the energy imparted to the animal this supreme result of his organization will be the crowning moment of his life the last degree of his affections and to some extent the harmonic expression of his faculties therein is the power of the physical man therein the grandeur of the moral man therein 
and the soul in its completeness and he who has not loved fully has not possessed his life abstract affections and speculative passions have won the homage of individuals and of nations blissful affections have been repressed or degraded social industry has opposed the men which the primitive impulse would have conciliated love must govern the earth which ambition wearies love is that peaceful and productive flame that warmth of heaven which enlivens and renews which causes birth and blossoming imparts colour grace and hope to life ambition is that sterile fire which burns beneath the ice consumes without animating anything hollows vast caverns disturbs in secret flashes forth in opening abysses and leaves a century of desolation to a country amazed by this illumination of an hour when some new incitement extends the relations of the man who makes trial of his life he welcomes it eagerly demands it of all nature abandons himself thereto and is elated therewith he centres his existence in love and in all things sees love alone all other sentiments are lost in this profound sentiment all thought leads up to it all hope rests upon it everything is but suffering emptiness abandonment if love withdraws but if it approaches then all is joy hope and felicity a far-off voice a sound in air the stir of the branches the quivering of waters all announce all express all imitate its accents and augment its desires the grace of nature is in the motion of an arm the world's law in the eloquence of a glance for love alone does the morning light awaken life and flush the heavens for this the noonday heat ferments the moist earth under the woodland moss to this the evening dedicates the pleasing melancholy of its mysterious glow this spring is that of vaucluse these rocks are those of melory this avenue is that of pamplemousses silence protects the dreams of love the motion of the waters penetrates it with sweet agitation the fury of the billows inspires its storm-like efforts and all shall command its pleasures when the night shall be mild when the moon shall enlighten the night when bliss shall be in the shades and the radiance in the solitude and in the air and the water and the night o oh, blissful delirium soul moment left to man this flower so rare so isolated so fleeting under the cloudy sky unsheltered beaten by winds wearied by storms languishes and dies without opening the keen air a vapour a breath makes void the hope in its withered bud we pass onward still hope and hasten far on upon a soil as sterile we see others as precarious doubtful momentary as itself who like it will perish vainly happy he who possesses that which man should seek who enjoys all which man should feel happy he also it is said who seeks feels and stands in need of nothing for whom to exist is to live it is not merely a mournful and morose but also a most fatal error to condemn this true and necessary pleasure which invariably looked for ever renewing independent of seasons and extended through the brightest portion of our days forms the strongest and most alluring bond of human society truly a very singular wisdom is that wisdom which is opposed to the natural order every faculty every energy is a perfection it is good to be stronger than our passions but to applaud the silence of the senses and the heart is merely stupid for it is to base a claim to additional perfection on the very fact which makes us incapable thereof the true man is one who is the lover of love without forgetting that love is only an accident of life when he is possessed by its illusions he enjoys and possesses them in his turn but without forgetting that there are austere truths which take precedence of the most beautiful illusions and further the true man knows how to choose and also to wait with prudence how to love consistently how to yield himself without weakness as well as without reserve 
the activity of a profound passion is for him the ardour of goodness the fire of genius he finds in love the voluptuous energy the masculine enjoyment of the just sensible and great heart he comes face to face with felicity and knows how to gain nourishment therefrom ridiculous or guilty love is a degrading weakness lawful love is the charm of life there is madness only in the mistaken austerity which confuses a noble with a vile sentiment condemning love indiscriminately because conceiving only men that are brutalized it can imagine nothing but sordid passions this pleasure received this pleasure imparted this progression sought and obtained this felicity offered and expected this voluptuous confidence which impels us to look for everything from the beloved object the still greater delight of rendering that object happy of being mutually sufficient to each other necessary one to another this fulness of sentiment and of hope enlarges the soul and spurs it on to live unspeakable abandonment he who has known can never feel ashamed thereof and he who is not made to experience it is not made to pass judgment on love as need scarcely be said i do not condemn those who have not loved but those who are incapable of loving our affections are determined by circumstances but broad feelings are natural to all who are perfect in their moral organization those who are incapable of love are also of necessity incapable of a generous sentiment or a sublime affection they may be upright good industrious prudent may possess amiable qualities and even reflected virtues but they are not men and they are devoid of soul or genius a person of this kind may be a desirable acquaintance may command my confidence and even my esteem but he will not be my friend hearts which are truly sensible hearts which a sinister destiny has kept down from their first springtime who shall blame you for having never loved every generous sentiment came natural to you and all fire of the passions informed your virile intelligence love was necessary thereto love was meant to nourish it love would have shaped it to great things but nothing has been accorded you the silence of love has heralded the void in which your life is quenched the consciousness of the just and the honourable the desire of order and the moral conformities lead necessarily to the necessity of love the beautiful is the object of love harmony is its beginning and end every perfection all merit seem to belong to it the amiable graces invoke it and a broad and virtuous morality ratifies it love it is true has no existence apart from the glamour of physical beauty but it would seem to cleave even more closely to intellectual harmony to the graces of thought to the depth of feeling union hope admiration glamour increase for ever towards the perfect intimacy that intimacy fills the soul which is exalted by their development there pauses and thence retrogrades the man who is impassioned without being sensible who has no other need than pleasure but the man who loves does not change like this the more he obtains the more he is bound the more he is loved the more he loves the more he possesses that which he has desired the more he cherishes his possession having received all he considers that he owes all she who gives herself to him becomes necessary to his being years of enjoyment do not weaken his desires but add only to his love the confidence of a habitual felicity and the delights of a free but delicate intimacy some presume to condemn love on the ground that it is a wholly sensual affection having no other motive than a necessity which they term gross but even in the case of our most complex desires their true end seems invariably to connect with foremost physical needs sentiment is only their indirect expression and the purely intellectual man was never other than a phantom 
our necessities awaken within us the perception of their positive end and the innumerable perceptions of objects which are analogous to those necessities the direct means would not of themselves fill life but these accessory impulses occupy it entirely because they are without bounds the man to whom life was intolerable without the hope that he could conquer the earth would not have conceived the ambition unless he had known hunger our wants combine two modifications of a single principle appetite and sentiment the preponderance of one over the other will depend on individual organization and overruling circumstances every end of a natural desire is lawful all means that it inspires are good if they do not invade the rights of others or occasion in ourselves any real disorder which counterbalances their utility you have sought unduly to extend the field of duties on the principle of exacting more than you want so as to obtain as much and this is an error if you demand too much of men they will rebel if you ask them for chimerical virtues they will simulate them accordingly saying that it costs little but seeing that such virtue is not part of their nature their secret conduct will be of an opposite kind while from the fact that it is secret you will be unable to curb its excesses and can have recourse only to those dangerous means the experiment of which will increase the evil by multiplying constraint and opposition between duty and inclination you will think at first that the laws will be observed better because their infraction will be more skilfully masked but false judgment depraved taste habitual dissimulation and hypocritical devices will be the true results there are signal physical oppositions in the pleasures of love its desires perturb the imagination its cravings transform the organs the way of feeling and looking at such an object must therefore vary correspondingly we must foresee the consequence of this disproportionate difference and not combine moral laws therewith which are calculated to increase it still further such laws are the work of the aged and aged people possessing no longer the sentiment of love can possess neither true modesty nor refinement of taste they misconstrue that which their years are no longer in a position to understand they would proscribe love altogether could they find other means of perpetuating the race their superannuated senses wither that which should be contained in the graces of desire and to avoid certain excesses which are detestable to their impotence they devise such clumsy checks that society is incessantly troubled by real crimes with which no honest man would reproach himself in the absence of reflection whatever is not actually hurtful should be permitted in love for thereby man is either perfected or degraded therein above all he must restrain his imagination within the limits of a just liberty place his happiness within the limits of his duty and rule his judgment by an exact appreciation of the basis of laws no other natural means can compare with it in its power to endow him with the perception of all refinements of taste and of their real ground to ennoble and restrain his appetites to impress on his sensations a species of sincere and upright pleasure to inspire the ill-organized man with something of the sensibility of the superior man to unite to conciliate them to form a real fatherland and institute a veritable society leave us the lawful pleasures these are our rights this is your duty you have i fancy supposed that something was achieved by establishing marriage as an institution but a union in which the consequences of your institutions compel us to follow the conformities of chance or to seek those of fortune in place of the real conformities the union which a single moment can for ever tarnish which are alloyed of necessity by a multitude of disgusts such union as this is inadequate i demand of you a lasting illusion and you offer me the naked chain of an unending slavery beneath those perishable flowers which you have so clumsily heaped over it and have yourself left to wither 
i ask you for an illusion which can disguise or renew my life this nature gave me you dare to speak to me of the resources which remain would you suffer me to outrage vilely an engagement which once made should be observed religiously and to persuade a woman to become contemptible in order that i may love her or less directly guilty yet not less thoughtless shall i cause anxiety to my family bereave relations and dishonour her to whom this species of honour is socially so essential or yet again to abstain from breaking any law and from exposing any one shall i seek in abject places those who can be mine not by a sweet license of manners not in virtue of a natural desire but because their trade places them at the disposal of all having ceased to belong to themselves they are no longer women but something indefinable which is analogous to womanhood forfeiture of every delicacy incapacity for any generous sentiment and the yoke of misery abandon them to the most brutal caprices of man in whom such a habit will deprave both sensations and desires certain possible circumstances do i admit remain but they are exceedingly rare and may even fail to be met with in an entire life some men restrained by reason consume their days in privations equally unjust and compulsory others and the majority by far make sport of the duty which opposes them from the standpoint of general opinion this has ceased to be a duty because its observation is contrary to the natural order of things the disdain which is felt for it leads nevertheless to the habit of deferring simply to custom of constituting one's own inclinations the sole law of conduct and despising every obligation the infraction of which does not actually involve legal penalties or social disgrace such is the unavoidable consequence of the real meannesses to which we have recourse daily for our amusement what morality can you expect in a wife who deceives him who maintains her or by whom she ought to be maintained who is his nearest friend and makes sport of his confidence who destroys his repose or laughs at him if he preserves it and involves herself in the necessity of betraying him to the very end by bequeathing to his affections the child that does not belong to him of all engagements is not marriage precisely the one where trust and good faith are most vital for the security of life how miserable is that sort of honesty which pays a crown scrupulously and reckons the most sacred promise that can be made between human beings as an idle word again what morality can you expect from the creature who while he makes sport of her seduces a woman and despises her because she has become that which he sought who dishonours her because she has loved him tires of her because he has enjoyed her and deserts her when she displays the visible tokens of having shared in his pleasures what morality what equity can you expect from that man at the very least so inconsequent who exacts sacrifices from his wife which on his part he does not make requires her to be discreet and unapproachable while he exhausts in secret connections the attachment of which he assures her and to which she lays claim by right if her fidelity is not to degenerate into an unjust bondage indiscriminate pleasures degrade man and guilty pleasures corrupt him but love apart from passion does not abase him there is an age for love and for enjoyment there is one also for enjoyment without love the heart is not always young and even while youth remains to it it does not always meet that which it can love truly there is good in every enjoyment which is exempt from injustice and excess when it is ruled by natural decencies and possessed in accordance with the desires of a refined organization the hypocrisy of love is one of the scourges of society why should love depart from the common law why should it not be just and sincere in that as in all things else he alone is absolutely isolated from all evil who seeks in simplicity that which can afford him enjoyment unmixed with remorse 
every imaginary or accidental virtue rests under suspicion for me when i see it rise up proudly from its false basis i seek and do not fail to discover an internal ugliness therein beneath the guise of prejudices and the frail mask of dissimulation permit and authorize pleasures in order that virtues may exist demonstrate the reason of laws in order that they may be revered invite men to enjoy so that you may be heard when you command them to suffer elevate the soul by the sentiment of natural pleasures and you will make it strong and great so that it will respect legitimate privations and will even find enjoyment therein through a conviction of their social utility i would have man make free use of his faculties when they do not assail the rights of others i would have him enjoy in order that he may be good i would have him quickened by pleasure yet directed by visible equity i would have his existence just happy and even voluptuous i would have the thinking being make use of his reason on the subject of his duties i have a very small opinion of the woman who is restrained only through a sort of superstitious dread of all which belongs to the enjoyments which she dares not confess that she desires even to herself i would have people ask themselves whether this or that thing is evil and why if so if it be let it be forbidden but if not let it be enjoyed with an austere choice with that prudence which is the art of finding greater pleasure therein but without reserve without shame and without disguise true modesty should alone set bounds to pleasure modesty is an exquisite perception a part of perfect sensibility it is the grace of the senses and the charm of love it avoids all that our organs would repel it permits all that they desire it separates that which nature has left to our intelligence the care of separating and it is chiefly the neglect of this voluptuous reserve which quenches love in the unwise liberty of marriage End of section forty one